Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. As our um, panelists have a seat. And I'm so glad to be here to speak on this very important topic. Because we all know the unique needs of students and communities um, because it's been heavily documented in our rural, rural um, neighborhoods and school districts and towns. Um, not too long ago, I spent a lot of time in Vance County actually um, meeting teachers and students and, um, and visiting classrooms. And you know, one of the one of, in one of my first meetings, I was speaking with someone, and I wanted to make sure I was always in contact with that person. Because I said, you know, you're going to have to be my friend. You're my contact, so I'm going to call you first every time I head to Vance County to, to Henderson. And the first thing she said was, she says, "Oh, I'm going to have to give you my Gmail email address because our school email doesn't work well." all the time. It works, but not all the time. And if you want to be able to contact me, that you literally are going to have to, um, you're going to have to use that giant Google company um, to get by, which I even have to rely on sometimes. So this is a very timely, timely discussion we're having today. And a very special panel. Um, we have Representative um, John Zoka. Did I pronounce it right? Please? Zoka. Soka? Soka. Don't pronounce it. Soka. I've been practicing that a long time. <laughs> Representative John Soka. He's a retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army. He's also owned and operated several businesses um, in Fayetteville. He represents House District 45, which encompasses Fort Bragg, Cumberland County, surrounding Fayetteville. And he chairs the Finance Committee and serves as Vice Chairman of the Commerce and Job Development Committee. So thank you for being here. We have Reverend Calvin Curtis Jones. He's an ordained minister and employed by the City County Inspections Department of Durham. He serves as a school board member for Durham <coughs> County Schools. He attended North Carolina Central University. He's married with three children two of which are teachers, so he gets extra points, and, um, and five grandchildren. And now I guess my new friend here, uh, Verna Lalbehuri. Did I say it okay? Yes. Yeah, she serves as the Director of Digital Teaching and Learning at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Prior to her tenure there, she was Senior Program Director at the Friday Institute for Educational Innovation at North Carolina State University, and she holds a BA from Smith College and a Master's of Education in Curriculum Reform from University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you for being here. And Jonathan Foster. He moved to Fayetteville as a young child and graduated from 71st High School pretty much in the top of his class. Mr. Foster holds a BA in political science and a master's degree in middle school math, both from Fayetteville State University. He spent almost 10 years in Cumberland County as an elementary school teacher and currently is a sixth grade math teacher at Sandy Grove Middle School in Hope County. So we know he can work anywhere in the country. He really doesn't change the way you teach sixth grade math. You're, you're highly sought after. Well, I'd like to start with, um, with Ms. Lal Bihari, and really, um, you know, what do we need to know about <coughs> access to the internet for rural students at school and at home? You know, we've heard um, a lot of comments this morning already, but really, how connected are they? Even our Lieutenant Governor said, well, soon we're going to be the first you know, state in America where, you know, there's going to be broadband in every classroom. Is it? That sounds really good. So I just want to ask you, you know, how close are we to that? Thank you, Leonida. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, yes okay. Um, I commend 
Congresswoman Clayton for actually hosting this event and inviting us. I think it's awesome that we're able to really create a sense of urgency around these issues. So uh, uh, thank you all for being here as well and committing to this. Um, the one thing I would say, and I think that you've heard throughout the morning, the homework gap is real. It's very real. Um, if you look nationally across the, the United States, approximately 70% of our educators are um, assigning work that requires internet access at home. And um, 5 million or so households do not have internet access. Um, and that's from Pew Research, which is dated, I would say, because it's on 2013, 2014. So just use that as a frame of reference. Um, in the state of North Carolina, you've heard that we're doing awesome stuff with regards to school connectivity. Right. We're in a really good place. Uh, we've partnered very closely with the Friday Institute at NC State. Some of you may know Mr. Phil Ema. He's kind of the, the grandfather. He's not that old, but he, he, you know, he, he's definitely uh, been the architect of a lot of our school connectivity um, efforts. Um, the, the Lieutenant Governor mentioned this morning in his uh, remarks that by uh, the end of this school year, we would be 100% connected. Right? Um, the uh, projections I have is close to the end of next school year. Let me, let me just explain. <laughs> uh, the, um, the school connectivity initiative started out in phases. Like phase one was really getting the, um, the broadband to LEAs, to school districts across, um, the, uh, across North Carolina. The initiative is 10 years old, so this started in 2006. Um, the second phase was getting the connectivity to the classrooms. And then the third phase, which we're in right now, is getting the connectivity, um, um, really wireless access points. Um, and we think of a digital ready classroom as having at least a minimum of one access point uh, per classroom. So um, we're, according to my data, and I have folk out there you know, getting data, um, and you have access to it right here, the digital learning and media inventory is an annual inventory that we administer here out of uh, DPI. If you all are educators, you will recall the AMTR. Who knows the AMTR? <laughs> okay. Uh, it was a very labor-intensive um, inventory that our educators completed. We streamlined it, tightened it, modernized it, and really got it to a place where we're looking at current issues. Um, so according to that data, we're at 70% with regards to um, classroom wireless access points. Our projection, this was last year's data, the school year 2015-2016. Um, right about now, we're at 80% access, so I think we'll be definitely at 100% at the beginning of, of next school year if our efforts move at the pace that we're going. Um, but in terms of a full, robust classroom access, um, we're looking at um, the, the magic year, which is in the school connectivity <coughs> report, is June of 2018. So, um, with regards to home access, I will say that the data is... Um, if, so to speak. Um, we attempted to address this question in our digital learning and media inventory, and there is some data that you've been provided with regards to home access, but just remember who's completing these inventories, right? This is reported by um, classroom teachers, uh, who, it's a proxy measure. So um, for the next round, we're tightening that question and trying to get uh, a little more detail around home access. But more importantly, I want to elevate the work of the uh, Broadband um, Infrastructure Office out of the Department of uh, Information Technology. And currently, they uh, have fielded a survey focusing on the homework gap, right? Focusing specifically on the homework gap and going out to parents. So the Friday Institute has helped develop the instrument. I spent some time looking at it. Um, we're at this point pushing it out whole hog to um, the state of North Carolina, really trying to access parents, right, so that you can get good information on, on home access. Um, um, I will also say that the, the data is very really important, so getting a handle and a good understanding of where we are um, is going to be important to define the appropriate solutions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, Mr. Jones, um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the challenges facing, you know, public school students in Warren County, especially when it comes to having access to broadband and even the internet. Warren County is very diverse 
the very rural. <coughs> Our superintendent, Dr. Ray Spain, and his staff have done a good job of trying to get access in the school system itself. And there are some companies who have devices that we can download and put it on the device and the kid can take it home. But that's not the same as having it at home. They want to do planning reading, want to do some studying on their own, and all of us know anybody's going to be successful, they're going to do some extra work on their own. And you know, I've listened at the stats this morning, and the first question went in my mind is if 50% of the children are in rural areas, we're going to go ahead and assume that 50% of the funding from our legislature that goes to schools is going where? To the rural area. Is that correct? Probably not. But I think that's one question we need to ask. And if I were a rich person and I wanted to get people to work for me, I would be looking at the rural areas. I would want everybody in the rural area to have access so y'all can make me more money. That would be a no-brainer in my opinion. But I don't think we're working that way. And I always like when I was trying to our school, I like to raise my hands like this. There's something to be said about people working together. I don't care who you are. If we can have a festival in our mind to work together. I believe I was, I was sitting with three young college students and I'm glad to see young students here today. I think we need young, middle-aged and old people working on this problem. Our kids have really got a problem with not having access. And I listen at Somebody mentioned how many legislators had seven counties and eight counties. But what if that legislature had access to everyone in that county through internet? So they're at a disadvantage. <coughs> so it's not just students. So I think we got to go at it from a standpoint of uh, there's something in it for everybody. So it's not just our students, but it's for everybody and we'll like it and we'll hurt it. And there's a lot of resources in one county. We own an hour from Research Triangle, we're hour and a half from Richmond. Why couldn't we start some businesses there? We got all this land there, and we could. But we gotta start thinking that way. We need our students to help us think that way. And I sus suspect that there are some students already thinking that way. And we need jobs so when kids like my kids finish college and get their masters and PhD, they can come back home and help us make more money so we can pay supplements to our teachers. That's a real problem. Well, Representative Soka, I know you've heard a lot of this before, I'm sure, and, um, and I guess in many ways you're trying to work on this. You're trying to make um, you're trying to um, close the divide that we're going to talk about today. And um, so right now I'd like to talk about the Bright Futures Act that um, I guess that looks looks at broadband connectivity and, um, and high-speed internet and how that's going. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, having me here today. It's a great opportunity to uh, talk about this act, but more importantly, it's an opportunity for me to uh, interact with many in the Education Committee um, or community. We know what the problems are in the role. We've heard it from our speakers here before. We've heard it on this panel so far. So I'm not going to go into what the problems are. There's a solution, uh, the beginning of a solution. Uh, and it's a free market uh, government combination solution. The solution is not just in state or federal funds to fix this solution. And I can give you an example of that. The federal government's been trying to fix connectivity to rural areas for many years with the Connect America Fund. They've had uh, phase one and now they're in phase two. And while I don't denigrate this Connect America, uh, America fund, uh, it's working okay, but it's not working fast enough. For example, uh, in our state, there's about $20 million that the federal government is giving to the incumbent uh, uh, providers like AT&T, CenturyLink, extensive, for the express purpose of extending their networks into rural areas so there's more connectivity. Sounds great. Sounds like a lot of money. What's it do on the ground? Well, in Cumberland County, where I live, it's going to, over five years, it's going to add another 338 households 
to the internet. In Jones County, it's going to add another two households or businesses. That's not the type of pace that I'm willing to put up with. So the federal government, again, they're doing good work, and, but it's, it's not fast enough. So if we expect government to solve the problems, either at the federal or state level, we're going to allow another generation of children to be bypassed, and, and we're going to be talking about these same issues 10, 20 years from now. And personally, I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to wait that long. So, so what is the answer? Well, let's, let's look first at, at what we have and why we don't have the last house on the last dirt road in every rural area connected. Okay? Well, we don't have that right now because it's not economics, economic for the big phone companies to do that. It, it just isn't. They, they make their money by laying cable, laying fiber, however they did, extending Wi-Fi and signing up subscribers. When you have distances in rural areas, as we all know, half mile, mile, two miles, you just can't afford to lay the cable and get the service out there. So it's not for lack of, of desire, it's just an economic thing. So, so we've got two issues here. We've got the, the digital infrastructure, meaning you know the cable, the Wi-Fi, that, and then we've got services. Now, the fundamental question that we have to answer here, and that I've been addressing in, in my bill, and trying, been working on this for a while, what the lieutenant governor, I might add, he is uh, involved in this as well, uh, is what level of government involvement is really appropriate in building out digital infrastructure. That's the cables, the Wi-Fi, and the second question is, is it appropriate for government to be involved in providing services? Services being you know, Netflix, Hulu, uh, email, you know, all that kind of stuff that you pay for and get it either on your phone or on your TV or whatever. So we already know why we don't have the rural broadband out there. I've already talked a little bit about the uh, Connect America Fund. So, what do I come up with, along with a lot of other folks? What's different, and how's it going to speed getting broadband to uh, rural areas? Well, it's basically a three-point plan. Uh, the first is we can make better use of our digital infrastructure that already is in place. I'm not talking about the privately owned things. I'm talking about infrastructure, cable, and Wi-Fi systems that are owned by municipalities and counties. Right now, there's a, a legal prohibition that needs clearing up that says if you have fiber laid for your own municipal purposes, you cannot use it for anything else. Okay? So imagine a pipe, if you will, a big pipe, you know, one used locally maybe to, uh, you know, this is the amount of information that can go through this pipe. They use about this much of it to control traffic signals. The rest of that fiber is called dark fiber because it's not lit, it's not doing anything, it doesn't benefit the city, it doesn't benefit anyone. So the first part of this bill basically allows cities, counties to lease out their dark fiber. The backbone is already there. Now, it's, you will find more backbone and dark fiber in municipalities, which are denser, than you will in counties because counties don't have a lot of traffic lights to operate out in rural areas and things like that. But there's still a lot of dark fiber out there that is connecting utilities, uh, other county-owned facilities, so it's there. If we allow them to lease it out in a public-private partnership with private enterprise, then the private part of the private enterprise problem is they've got the backbone, so then they just have to get that last mile connection. It's a lot less expensive to do that than build the network from the ground up. And quite frankly, in the building boom of around 2000, there was way too much fiber laid everywhere, and there's still a lot of it laying around not being utilized. So it's a market-based solution, public-private partnerships. The private provider recoups his investment in the last mile by providing services. There have been some solutions here that we've tried within the state that has allowed municipalities to get into the service aspect of it, not only providing the connection, but also providing the service. In my opinion, that's not a good model. It hasn't worked well and it puts government in direct competition with private enterprise, which is not a recipe for success. Um, so we've got, that's step one, where uh, we make better use of our digital infrastructure that's already in place. Now, let's talk about electric co-ops for a minute. Many rural areas, they get their electricity through their co-op. Remember, um, if, you're, if you pay your bill, you're a member of the co-op. Co-ops have the same issue here with a lot of dark fiber, okay? 
allow them, they tell me, and I've been working very closely with co-ops for months now, they tell me that they already have the ability to do this. So part of this is just a mindset change for not only co-ops and municipalities, but for everyone in the room too. Like from the co-ops, they want to provide electricity. They don't want to provide services. And we had almost a year's worth of conversations with them, me to tell them, I don't want you to provide services. You're great at providing electricity to rural areas. Continue to do that. However, have you looked at using the dark fiber that you have? And, and now, many of them, uh, they're on board, they get it. They know I'm not trying to force them to do something to change their business model. So they're looking at using their dark fiber, leasing it out in public-private partnerships. Another thing that co-ops have access to, if you look at the USDA, uh, for rural areas, they have pots of money there available for different things. One of the programs they have is uh, Wi-Fi thermostats for rural areas. Okay, so if you've got a house, the last house on the last dirt road that doesn't have any connection to anything, but now all of a sudden the USDA <coughs> is providing money to provide the last mile connection to that last house on the last dirt road, and they have a Wi-Fi thermostat that's actually a Wi-Fi hub, all of a sudden you're making advantage of what's available. So once again, there's not this multi-billion dollar investment that somebody has to make and they'll never recoup their money. You use what's available, you take advantage of funds that are available to the, the federal government, and, and then you get a service provider that says, hey, that's a great idea, and they come in and they provide the service. So co-ops are not providing services, they're just helping facilitate the build out to the last house and the last road. And if I say that enough times, and I say it a lot, I do, because it's really important when I'm talking to other legislators to understand the concept of what we're trying to accomplish with this. It isn't just to have cities build out or counties. It is that last house on the last dirt road, and I think we're all in agreement on that. So we've got co-ops, that's an example of that. So that's the first part. The second part is there does need to be some new digital infrastructure cable and Wi-Fi or whatever the new technology is going to be built out. So we build sewers, we extend water into rural areas, we dig a lot of dirt and then fill it in, right? Well, while we're digging that dirt, wouldn't it make kind of sense to lay down the conduit where you can run some fiber through it? I mean, would to me, you know, dig a hole, fill it in, go back, dig a hole, fill it in. You can do that any number of times, but let's just dig one hole put in whatever we're putting in, water pipes is one of my favorites, but uh, you know, put the conduit in with the fiber there. Counties and municipalities as they extend or whatever the water system or the sewer system is can do that at relatively low cost while they're doing it. This bill will give them permission to do that. And then the first part of the bill gives them permission to lease it out. So is that, that's a longer term uh, thing to do, but you've got to start somewhere. So it's not going to get all the service out to the last house on the last dirt road tomorrow. But if counties know that they can do that, why wouldn't they do it for minimal expenditure when you already have the trench open? Well, representative. And, and I've got one other thing too. And the third part of the bill, I know, I'm monopolizing it. this. Small well, time just, over at DPI I where i got a friendly that. audience, so I better make sure. <laughs> uh, the, the last thing is to make sure that the co-ops understand in the law that they do have the authority <laughs> To, to do what they think they have to do. And that's it. No, I just wanted to know, so when is this gonna pass? You know, how long is this gonna take? I mean, you probably <coughs> sold the people in this room, but have you sold your, your colleagues? And, and that's a good, and that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, the uh, comparison to legislating the making sausages very good, and I have made sausage actually in my district as well. I went to a hog killing this uh, January, and we made some sausage, and that was interesting. That was fun. I, uh, but um, the stakeholders in this are um, everybody in this room. There, there's a, extending broadband to rural areas doesn't just affect um, teachers and education. There's a health aspect to it for telehealth, and there's a lot of other things, grid maintenance. I mean, it, it, it benefits everyone. If business, the thing you were talking about, why don't businesses want to be there? Well, they don't want to be there because they don't have sewer, water, or internet. Why are they going to be there? If we get them internet, they're more likely to go there, which brings jobs, which is really my focus, why I want to be a legislator, to make this state a better place for jobs. So 
The stakeholders involved are legislators explaining this concept because there is this friction between government involvement and what is essentially private enterprise and, and where is that point where government is over involved not allowing private enterprise to do what they do. So there's an explanation of that to other legislators. The other stakeholders in this are the incumbent uh, communications companies, AT&T, Time Warner, which was uh, purchased by Charter, and you know the, the big phone companies to make sure that we're not really dabbling in their market and, and taking away from private enterprise. So I've been working with them and working with the co-ops. To make a long story short, we've been working, and there's a number of us been working on this uh, legislation uh, for well over a year. I think I'm almost at the point, I had a conversation right before I came in the building here today with one of the incumbent uh, phone companies, I won't mention which one, they said, if you just make these three small changes to the bill, the last draft I saw were not only neutral, were supportive. And those were already three things I was going to change. So I am more than guardedly optimistic, um, whatever the next level is, positively optimistic that we can get it past this session. This session. So Mr. Foster, that's what I want to ask you. What do you think about the, um, I guess what the representative just said, you know, and uh, about the Bright Futures Act. And um, also, what would you like to see in your classroom of very lively, smart sixth graders? Well, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, first I want to send a good morning to our moderator and good morning to everyone in the building. Um, and those yeah. beautiful children singing. So I know yeah. it may be a little distracted, a little distracting, but think of it as angels. Our representative said a lot. A lot was said. And um, I think what he said is very important, that there definitely needs to be access to the internet um, among rural communities. Um, all the information that you've seen earlier with the facts and figures, I can put names and faces to those facts and figures. So it, make, it makes it more personal, personal to me. I see these kids every single day. Um, as far as um, with my students um, and the technology I want to see, um, as you know, as teachers, we have, we use a lot of our own money. And it's not a lot. We don't get paid a lot compared to other areas. Um, one thing that I definitely want to use in my classroom is um, there is this technology where I can speak into a microphone and then as I group my students, I can put like a little speaker in their area and I can speak into a microphone and everybody can hear it where they are. Um, I see more of myself as a facilitator of education and not the sage of stage. Um, you'd be amazed at what you can learn from students by just listening. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's something that can be very hard as a teacher because I like to talk a lot. <laughs> but um, as far as um, the technology goes, um, students, they need to have access. Um, a lot of my assignments that I want to give, I can't really give because students don't have access to the internet. Um, I have students who are living on farms and they don't have necessarily the time to spend on homework like I want them to because they have to do chores. They have to take care of the children. They have to feed the cat. They have to do all these other things. So I take that into consideration. Um, one thing that I personally do to help address this technology issue is I provide specific time in the classroom for students to work on instruction. Now for some, they say, well, that's what homework is for. But people, you don't know what kind of lives these children live. You don't know what they face once they leave your classroom. And when they come to school, that might be the only meal they ever see that day. Or as a teacher, my face might be the only smiling face they see the entire day. So I try to find opportunities for students to work on their assignments in classrooms. Like for example, something that I use, I might use a website called GoFormative.com. And with that website, what they do is, they sit, I, I give them questions, they answer questions, I'm able to give them immediate feedback. And also something else I use is Khan Academy. For those who are familiar with Khan Academy, great website, awesome website. They get that feedback. But however, like, like one of our um, panelists said before, they need that practice outside of home too. Yes. Now of course, I can watch them while I'm there in my classroom all day long, but what are they doing? That's also what's important. 
So they do need access um, to technology. Um, I would love to do a whole lot more, but funds are limited, as you've been told before. microphones roaming around the room so if you have a question you'd like to ask this um, this great group of panelists I think they cover the gamut almost anything you'd like to know on this topic they probably can answer it any questions so as we wait for questions it's okay yes. just piggyback on a couple of things um, when we think of digital equity we've been talking a lot about um, broadband connectivity and home access I think it's also important to consider it holistically and think about equity of devices, right? Very important. Um, and then also equity in terms of making sure that our students have um, teachers who are well prepared, teachers who know what, um, you know, how, how to teach <laughs> in the digital age. Um, uh, one of the uh, components of the digital learning plan and the key legislation that was passed in 2013 um, was to um, identify a set of digital learning competencies for classroom teachers and classroom and administrators, school administrators. Building level leadership is very important. Um, and so these competencies are out there. They've been uh, approved by the state board last June. Um, our division in, in partnership with Friday Institute has been penetrating the field with um, professional learning. Um, for, for administrators as well as uh, classroom teachers. Um, but I think the important piece here with rural um, professional development, that's where I'm getting to, is um, making sure we can go to them. Making sure that we can go to them. Like, the, the biggest complaint that I get is that we all cannot travel to Raleigh for PD. Right? So uh, it's cheaper for me to send three of my consultants out to you know the far west than for 180 educators to come here to Raleigh. So um, I've made the commitment to make sure that we can actually get out to um, the, the rural counties and, and provide some more professional learning around um, the digital learning competencies. So. One thing I just thought about is talking. If all the counties had access to internet, Rather than sending those three, you could be right here on the mic, and it goes to all 100 counties <laughs> through the internet. And I'm wondering how much money the DPI saved then. So those are some funds we could be looking at also. Blended learning, very important. Yes. You have a question? Say your name, please. Oh, I'm Brenda Berg with SNC. Um, and I just wanted to say, first of all, I had the coincidental but distinct pleasure of seeing Mr. Foster teach yesterday. And he, <laughs> I would love to as a teacher. I would love for my children to have you as a teacher. And you really did um, personify that you were listening to the kids and letting them get the classes. It was heartwarming. It was fantastic. So thank you for all you do. And I will just put a plug for Sandy Grove Middle School and all of Hope County. Every single school in Hope County last year <clears throat> met or exceeded growth. Every single school. teachers like Mr. Foster and his principal who told me as I walked in the door, no exceptions, no excuses. We love these students as they are during the hours that we have them. And during those hours, one thing I want to point out is you have one-to-one -one laptops. Every single student at the middle school has a laptop. They are not able to bring them home at this point in time. Could you speak to um, how that has helped bring you up in terms of all of this growth and achievement that you're seeing in your school? And how is those how have those laptops changed your world? I saw one example, your kids are taking assessments on Thursday this week, yes. and you will be analyzing the data on Monday, yes. which is not happening often enough. So speak to the importance of that. Um, and then, of course, with, with Congressman Soto's um, bill, what did that change for you in terms of the kids being able to use those laptops at home? A lot to address. <laughs> Um, as far as students using the laptops, we do have a one-to-one -one initiative in Hill County. Um, that has changed my learning in a, my, my learning as a teacher and the way I teach in a variety of ways. Um, one thing that I've noticed is I'm able to get more in-depth into learning as far as technology goes. Um, and part of my classroom culture is that I like I allow students to share what they know. And believe me, students know more about technology than we 
<laughs> they definitely, they can show you a few things. Um, as far as me as a teacher, I feel like it's maybe, maybe more concerning the depth of the knowledge that students know. I'm more concerned with the depth than just the wide knowledge. Um, it has definitely uh, helped increase my students' test scores. My, um, my students' scores are one of the highest in the county. All right. Uh, so I'm going to kill And I think a lot of that is um, due to the technology. Um, it's not just important enough for students to have a computer in front of them. It's how they use it. Um, they can communicate with each other through Google Classroom. That's something that I use a whole lot often. Um, not only do I put their morning work um, in there, in Google Classroom, but also I put their assignments in there. And I encourage students to talk to each other during that time. Um, if I'm not available, I, um, go ahead and email each other with questions they may have about the assignment. Because sometimes students can give each other more insight than sometimes a teacher can. Um, they get, they're getting more comfortable with the technology. I'm getting used to taking assessments online. That is definitely helping my students a whole lot. Um, and also, it's just using something that they already use all year. I'm sure you know of some student or some kid who, who plays the Xbox, who plays the PlayStation, or gets on the internet, Facebook. It's just using the technology that they already used to. And it helps with that engagement piece as well. That's an important thing, that it keeps them engaged. Now, of course, I, I have a lot of knowledge to dispel, but sometimes I get to start sounding like that teacher from Charlie Brown, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and students tune out. But if I present my information in a different way, using something that they're already more comfortable with, well then that's just an added bonus. And um, like Ms. Beth said, we do use, um, we are constantly data driven. We look at the data. I can be the best teacher in the world, but people look at the data. They look at the testing data. I can say I'm awesome, I, I just, I know I talk my heart out, but what does the testing data say? Is, is, is there that transfer from what I taught to what they show on a test? And, and to, what, um, to what Representative was saying as far as the broadband, um, they need that. Students need that. And it helps with the practice. Because students need a lot of practice on my um, I, I have a, students from a wide, um, wide range of buildings. I have students in my class on the first level, first grade level. Just students who are prepared for college. And it's hard to cover that area. It's extremely hard. But one way I can do that is through technology. By through differentiation for each individual student. Because it's be very difficult for me to come up with 12 different lesson plans for different groups of students. But through the use of technology, what I can do is I give them specific assignments that will meet them where they are and take them to where they need to be. So we have a question right there. Good morning. My name is Dan White. I am an adjunct professor at Elizabeth City State University and vice chair of the Quimmins County School Board. I have two of my student teachers here today. I have been amazed since I retired in 2010 at how dramatically education has changed. We have seen a transformation. So I'm glad to see that when we talk about uh, making rural schools, I want to scratch out history and just add making rural schools great to include those rural universities. So my comment to DPI, when you collaborate with the Friday Center and you send people out to provide staff development for the public schools, that you include the universities. Because we have that divide there, and I have a fantastic <laughs> consultant with the Friday Center, but she says, Dr. White, I can't come to your school for free. And I have to say, I don't have any money. Can you meet me halfway? I'll bring my students there to meet you. But if you would include us, we would appreciate yes, that. Absolutely. And um, I'm actually, today's the 29th. 
So yesterday we had a professional development um, session on the digital learning competencies and it was actually hosted at Elizabeth City State University. So, and so I we were to make sure to teach the you that I didn't know nothing yes. about. Wow. So we need to make sure to break the dots from that one. So, um, but uh, the work that DPI provides, again, is um, you know, at no cost to and that would be clear on that. Um, and you know, the, the other piece of, of the digital learning competency that I spoke to earlier is making sure that um, we're not only addressing in-service teachers, but also the pipeline, so pre-service teachers. So your point is extremely well taken uh, with regards to uh, teacher preparation programs and engaging, engaging them as well. Well, thank you. We have a question right here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Carolyn Ross Holmes. I'm the Executive Director of the Ella Baker Educational Project of North Carolina and a resident of Warren County. My question is directed to our good representative who's working on the bill. I know that you get many, um, lots of input from, from lobbyists and from your colleagues in terms of the content of that bill itself. And there's one thing that I'd also like to make sure that's given consideration. In addition to having access to that last house on the last mile. You were listening. Good. I was. <laughs> it's also the affordability factor. Yes. And the affordability factor, even though that last house on the last mile may not have the means to pay for that market rate to have access to the internet. And you mentioned that the government's role in terms of making sure they don't overreach into the markets. I would like for you to also give consideration to the role, think of the example of the post office. The post office is a service that is provided by the government to make sure that a letter is mailed to that last house on the last mile of the road. And it also keeps in check our private industry in terms of pricing when you compare it to a FedEx or a UPS and those other market providers. So I think we do have a role in terms of making um, internet available to that last house on the last mile and making sure it's affordable as well. So would you please get back some response? Absolutely. You bring up two good points I'd like to address. <coughs> The first uh, is, is government's role. If you go back in history to the 1930s and 1940s, the big discussion they were having at the time was how do we get uh, rural produce and food to markets? And it spurred uh, road building. It, it was infrastructure, government got involved. Right now, the debate is exactly as you framed it. Uh, is should we be providing that right now? And that is the debate that's being had. And I would say that where we are in this century, that that paradigm is shifting to more of a post office type thing, but we're certainly not there yet. I mean, in, in my role as a legislator and, and trying to think into the future on some of these things to see where things are going, um, you might find this surprising. Just like every educator doesn't think alike, not every educator, or not every representative in the center thinks alike either. So part of the issue is education of the populace in general is to how important it is to get connected. Well, I just talked briefly about education. Let's talk about health care for a minute, rural health care. I mean, you, you talk about a place for opportunities to improve the lives of people. It's in health care. And not only that, but the opportunities for savings. I've been at NC State and seen over there in some of their advanced labs where um, well, first of all, trivia question here. What's the biggest health care problem in the state of North Carolina? Blood pressure. Diabetes. Okay, diabetes. So blood sugar. They've developed this thing over at NC State, not quite ready to market yet. The little patch about 4x4 four four, you can stick on your skin. It's powered by the electrical impulses in your skin. It has a built-in <coughs> transmitter that will transmit to broadband by Wi-Fi, so if your blood sugar gets out of whack, it can send you an alert on your phone, it can send your doctor an alert, something else. Picture that if we had in rural areas with all the extra miles, ambulances running up and down the road, and EMTs going to service all these. How about, you know, drink orange juice, eat a cookie, whatever you got to do, 
because it's triggered by that because you have Wi-Fi. We could save, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of dollars in, in Medicaid expenses right there. Not to mention just everybody's, you know, health insurance, however you get it, uh, coming down. So people have to, the general populace has to change the way they think about it. It, it, it's a shift in par paradigm, which is going to take some time, but as long as people are talking about it, over time that will happen. The second issue you brought up was affordability to the last house on the last dirt road. And I'm glad you brought that up because part of the uh, beauty of this, as long as municipalities and counties and the co-ops will do it, is the biggest expansion <coughs> is in the backbone. The, the, the major fiber lays, or however they get it there, they go over many, many miles. It's very expensive to dig it and stick it in the ground or to attach it to poles or whatever. If we're leasing things that's already there, it takes a big component of cost out of it. If we take advantage of some of the programs that the federal government has for funding, like my one example, the Wi-Fi thermostat, that lowers the overall cost of getting the, the connection to that house Therefore, if the overall cost is lower, the services should cost lower as well. And that's why when you have a public-private partnership, the public part of that, municipalities, counties, will hopefully be concentrated on the welfare of their citizens and drive the best deal, which is the beauty of a public-private partnership because you've got competition. Just like I've got a Sprint carrier, you might have Verizon. Yeah, up there. there we go. Look at that. I didn't even know that. So, so that's that's the beauty of doing that to keep the cost down. So you keep it down by using what's already there, which lowers the overall cost, and then uh, take advantage of uh, federal programs or state programs if there are any. It's not going to solve itself. I mean, we can't make everybody sign up for a service, but if it costs ten dollars instead of seventy-five dollars, if you're a parent with, with children. I mean, can afford five, ten bucks, whatever, and, and maybe the cost uh, in some counties is that they uh, would need to subsidize it somehow for some other program. I, I'm not ruling that out. I'm not mandating it, but I'm certainly not ruling it out. Um, the, the one program that you may be alluding to, and I'm not sure if it is, is uh, the FCC has a lifeline program. Um, and that's, uh, that's, a federal, that, that's a federal program. Yeah, um, that's a different program. But that's, that, different that's, program. that's, that's but, different but pot of money, money, yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a pot of money that my understanding is not taxed enough. Um, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, a digital equity convening that took place yesterday. NC Broadband, uh, or the Broadband Infrastructure Office, is actually doing what we need to be doing, what we should have been doing a long time ago, is bringing together a diverse set of stakeholders to address this, uh, the issue of, of digital equity. And um, one of the things they're working on is um, guiding or advising the FCC in terms of how to how to get our um, constituents to fully leverage these federal programs and make them um, remove some of the barriers to accessing them, to, to accessing the, um, the, um, the resources. So um, that's definitely um, a big piece of, of affordability because of my understanding is that uh, based on income eligibility, <coughs> we're not leveraging it fully. Um, so community engagement, community outreach, making sure that our, our constituents are aware of, of programs like this um, is really, really important. Um, the, the other piece that I think is worth mentioning is that that Lifeline program in 2016 was modernized <coughs> to include broadband. So that's why the, the important push to um, get more folk to access it. I'd like to throw a plug in by one of our county commissioners here today. We have a broadband committee in one county that's already starting to try to work together. So I would encourage all counties that are here today to at least form a committee and start working together. Thank you. We have one more question before we wrap up the forum break. Do uh, you have a question on this side also? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, this lady first. Hi, my name is Lindsay Saunders. I'm here and actually an advocate uh, with results. We fight poverty issues on the U.S. global level. Uh, but relating to some of the things you've said, um, I, I um, grew up in Dare County, which is a very rich county, but uh, we had a family business. My dad was a home builder. We were on reduced lunch, so I remember my parents giving me four dimes for lunch. Um, and I actually went to school and got an education degree. And when I was a student teacher, um, it was very challenging. I was working in Pitt County. Um, sometimes I would share my food with my kids and behavior plan with one student. I took him to the movies one night and 
I looked at the magic in his eyes. I don't think he'd ever been in movies. Um, so after undergrad, it took me to Alaska for a couple years to teach, and I came back to North Carolina. And um, I found that in North Carolina schools, um, as a teacher, I didn't feel respected, supported, or wanted. So I left. Um, and um, I worked as a paralegal while I got my master's degree in communications. Since then, I've been working in tech companies and marketing agencies. Um, and now I train people um, to advocate to meet with congressmen for issues tied to health and education on the national level and um, internationally. I just came back from Zambia where I was looking at education resources there. Um, but my question is, since I have had contracts in tech companies like Lenovo and Red Hat, um, we've got tech growth exponentially here. Um, I'm all about partnerships. Um, partnerships with, with our government leaders, partnerships with community organizations. Um, what about partnerships for grants? And, you know, give them, give them their brand um, as sponsors, but um, grants to, uh, and doing surveys with, with um, families to find out, I'm, I'm sure you have some data on that, the accessibility that they do have at home. Like my student who I took to the movies, he didn't even have a working phone in his house. Um, so we had to go to his neighbor's house to call him and say, um, Ms. Saunders, I got permission, please take the movies. Um, but where are there grant partners, some sort of partnerships to um, fund the resources to be in their homes, more accessibility in the schools? Um, we've got the growth, so why, uh, what partnerships, I guess, government is a great safety net, but like you said, it's not the entire solution. So um, what kind of partnerships do we have, particularly with tech companies, um, to get them involved? Is that for, for me? Is that okay? um, well, I heard you mention uh, government not being the only solution, okay. but I mean, you have ties to PI, you're a teacher, and you have a board of ed. My dad was a board of ed, actually. So, um, what sort of partnerships? Uh, whoever can answer that, whatever you're seeing, whatever you're not seeing, um, we need more of that. I'll take a quick hack at that. Um, you know, state government is not involved with a major partnership to do these things, but I think that once we get uh, uh, access out places. That's another example of a great idea that I, I've been at a couple of conferences and people have ideas like that. What about grants for devices? What about that? Well, you know what? That's what makes America great, folks, because when you get a lot of people together to try and solve a problem in one room, we come up with ideas like that. So that might be perfect for the access. I mean, I haven't looked at that. I'm still focusing on the legislation to to get past so we can actually build the, the systems out there. But w once it's out there, I, I think your county and I think the teacher there, I think everybody would be interested in, in pursuing that. So. so I definitely think there's um, a level of awareness that we need to create because, um, you know, the, the, we have some existing community foundations that we need to make sure are aware of this challenge and are included as a funding priority in their grand, st in grand stream, so to speak. Um, so looking at you know, our, big, our big foundations as well as our small community foundations and brokering conversations with them is critical. Um, I, when you talk about tech companies, I think that's really important because most tech companies have a corporate citizenship yeah. division. Um, and so we need to appeal to them as well and make sure that they have this, um, you know, um, broadband on their radar screen. Um, the one that I will mention right now because I'm trying to push out information on it is the Sprint One Million project. Please tell me you all know about that. <laughs> okay, so yesterday when I was at, at this meeting, um, there's an organization called Everyone On, and um, you know they're really trying to get the word out that Sprint is um, at the place where they've committed over the next five years in increments of 200k. Now this is a national in initiative, folks. So know that it's gonna, you know, when it gets to North Carolina, the numbers are gonna dwindle. Uh, but these are. This is an initiative that will um, uh, afford selected schools and school districts devices as well as connectivity. And there's an application process. It ends up being a little labor intensive, but just just know that there are some initiatives out there that um, we um, need to get the word out on. That also brings up a need for having some information bank that 
there's been questions like this last we could go there like you say you're trying to push that information out if we knew I could go to your place or this place or my place whoever place there is there's this information on digital on broadband the speed of broadband you know because there are different definitions of the speed of broadband you know not just broadband Yes, so I have to address that yeah. because um, that's part of because it's very timely, sure. very very timely. As part of the digital learning initiative, um, one of the uh, strands of work is continuous improvement, right? And and how do you focus on continuous improvement by making sure that we have access to appropriate data, data like exactly what you mentioned. Um, we have a prototype out there. The Friday Institute has been working hard at it. We've shared it with our educated constituents, with our superintendents. Um, called the Digital Learning Dashboard. And so it'll give you a snapshot. All the data that we just looked at today, you would be able to get in a very snapshot, um, end user friendly uh, format. So just know that that is in the works. Um, we've spoken a lot about data today, folk. Um, and I think it's really important for us as we look at data to consider that if the data doesn't challenge you, it's not going to change you. Right? So, so it really, um, with the form of assessment, with the data that we're looking at, um, I think that's just an important concept to consider. Well, I have one more very short question before we wrap up. Thank you. Very short question. Yeah, short question. <laughs> uh, I'm Reverend Curtis Gatewood. I'm with the North Carolina State Conference of the NAACP. Of course, Reverend Barbara is our president who happens to be in Georgia who wants to be here. Our education committee chair is Dr. Tim Tyson, who recently came out with a new book on Emmett Till. All that to say, uh, we do have representation. We'll be here when I leave. I must leave. But I just wanted to uh, put a thought out. As we talk about rural and digital uh, education, uh, and uh, in 2013, when this bill was passed, I think it's House Bill 44, if I'm not mistaken. We need to put that bill in context, as uh, Dr. Terry Williams talked to us about the intersectionality of issues and how we need to work those issues together. In 2013, at the same time, he just spoke about health and, uh, and, and health in North Carolina. A half million North Carolinians were denied Medicaid expansion. Yes. In that same year, in the same year, 920,000, the poorest, hardest working America, uh, North Carolinians had to earn income tax credit taken away, causing their taxes to go up. And in the same year, I think it was uh, several thousands of unemployment, uh, people who lost jobs and no fault of their own were denied unemployment benefits, about 170,000 North Carolinians. Uh, my point is, how is it in that context, and, have, and after hearing all the facts about people not having access to broadband, would you pass a bill especially coming off the hills of where so much money uh, was cut out of the budget for te textbooks. How will we so quickly cut uh, or, or mandate poor people going into <coughs> digital uh, education when the, when the infrastructure is not there, the money is not there, and you made sure the money wouldn't be there because you've been cutting, they've been cutting the budget ever since. So I'm wondering, is there anyone in here who, 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 who voted for House Bill uh, 44, and and I would like to hear what their explanation would, uh, for that vote would be, considering the context in which we talk about these issues. Well, thank you for that question. Being the only politician up here, I guess that's mine to have. <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, you certainly have uh, your opinions in, in this country are entitled to them and to voice them according to the First Amendment. Uh, I did vote for those other bills, uh, and I'm a conservative Republican, and I'm not ashamed to say it. Now, I don't have time in the next one minute that the timekeeper <laughs> is shaking her head uh, to adequately respond to all those. I have talked to the NAACP chapter led by Jimmy Buxton down in Fayetteville on numerous occasions, and every time they invite me, I go there, and uh, I'd be willing to uh, debate all those issues and any others you want to down in Fayetteville at one of their Sunday afternoon meetings. You debate them right here. No, I think we're not here today, and I'm also late for a committee meeting on health care over in the